This morning's responsive reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. So this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, may your name be honored. May your kingdom come. May your will be done as in heaven, so on earth. Give us today the bread we need now. And forgive us the things we owe, as we too have forgiven what was owed to us. Don't bring us into the great trial, but rescue us from evil. about some Pearl Harbor veteran survivors to show that the show noted that to the day they died, some of them could never forgive the Japanese people for the attack on Pearl Harbor, which dragged the United States into the Second World War. When I set a schedule for the day for the sermon series, I really didn't look at what would be preached on what Sunday. Sometimes things just work out. So today, in the midst of remembering the innocent civilians who lost their lives, lost their relatives, lost the lives of relatives, that they changed their lives with that attack in the World Trade Center 21 years ago. Which is just like yesterday. Many families still have unhealed wounds. So a sermon on forgiveness today is both pertinent and challenging. Like the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, the events around 9 11 are challenging to get young. And like those born after December 7, 1941, thousands in our country have no memory of the terror, uneasiness, and changes those terrorists attacks generated. And God does not let us simply move away from those instances when we have been deeply hurt. Because we remember. He doesn't let us go off easy, get off easy when it comes to our relationships. He doesn't allow us to hide from our conflicts with others or theirs with us. I don't know if you noticed it, but this verse begins with the word and. It follows the food person read last week. And forgive us as we too have forgiven. That little word and connects the petition to the one in need of the above it, which suggests that food is central to our relationship with God. From asking for food, we're immediately driven into seeking forgiveness. So here's a question to ponder. Is there really something about provide provision for food or the lack of it in consideration of those who don't have enough to eat and the food we waste central to our faith? That question is for another day, but it's interesting because it's providing food so that others can live. It's providing that food that death that we owe. Now let's look at the word. The Greek word for forgive that's used in this text. The Greek word used in this text is athemi. 
It means to release, send away, or let go. The suggestion is that we are asking for a free walk from our behavior. When we ask for forgiveness, we are requesting that we would be set free from having our wrongdoing held against us. We're essentially released from any guilt or shame that we feel. Forgive us our sins, we pray. And we want the right to walk away from them. We ask the one we sinned against to free us from the consequences. And why, won't we, why wouldn't we want to be free of the consequences? Paul in Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. He follows with, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Scripture assures us that there is hope for us. God provides the opportunity for us to have a redo. Now, the frightening thing about a redo is that our redo is dependent on our facing the reality that all of us have sinned. Even in the Old Testament, the prophets often condemned claims of the innocence of people as self-deception. I didn't do anything wrong. It was Mike. He's the one to blame. He's the one who insulted me. I didn't do anything wrong. In fact, several verses of the Old Testament record God requiring repentance after one admitted their sin. That is to say, you didn't move on. You didn't just say, okay, I did it. There's something else that happens, an action, and that action is, I need to change what I do. To be forgiven of our sin, we have to change our attitude and the, the consequent action that results from that. That was the sin. There are some instances of synagogue prayers for forgiveness that are preceded by confession of sin. John, in his first letter, picks up the same theme in 1 John 1, verses 8 through 9. He says, if we claim that we were free of sin, we're only fooling ourselves. A claim like this is errant nonsense. On the other hand, if we admit our sins, make a clean break of them, he won't let us down. He'll be true to himself. He'll forgive our sins and purge us of all wrongdoing. So there's a path to life for us. All we must do is come clean and recognize not who we might think we are, but how we look to God. John also gives us a stern warning. He says we need to be honest with ourselves because in his words, translated by Eugene Peterson, verses 1, 1 John 1, 10, he says this, if we claim that we've never sinned, we out and out contradict God, make a liar out of him. A claim like that only shows off our ignorance of God. Wow, that's really powerfully strong, isn't it? So who wants to make God a liar? I mean, does anyone want to really challenge the Almighty to a truth contest? Well, who do you think would win that? If we really want to be honest with ourselves, as painful as that may be, all of us have something in the background that we did that hurt, undermined, or discounted someone's idea, person, family, or accomplishment. In most cases, the further we get from those, such, from those actions, the less we think about them. It's also possible we don't realize how our behavior impacted someone else. Or maybe we do recognize the impact. But we're either too ashamed or too proud or fearful to face it. So it eats away at us. 
We carry guilt, and, and maybe it keeps us awake for a time. It doesn't go away just because we push it to the back of our minds, does it? When I was growing up, my aunt and uncle, and by the way, I grew up in the slate belt, so when I say they had a slate board in their kitchen, that was kind of normal, you know? Well, they had this slate board, chalkboard, and they'd record reminders for themselves or reminders to the other or share, or share something that they needed their kids to know. They'd make a grocery list on it. So it was really used a lot. The board would be erased when one of the items, one of the reminders was no longer needed. But there was a residue of chalk that did not easily wipe off. To get the board easily clean, really clean, and remove that chalk dust, the board had to be washed, and the eraser would have to be cleaned as well. You could use the board as long as the chalk can be seen from the chalk dust left behind, but sooner or later, it had to be wiped clean. That's true of us as well. We can't hide for a while behind a happy facade. We can hide for a while behind a happy facade. But without coming to grips with our sins and repenting of them, we carry the residue, and that ultimately leads to more sin. Our life experiences are like that. Each experience leaves memories we often recall because they were pleasant, or perhaps we'd like to forget. My life experience tells me that the enjoyable things I want to remember are more easily forgotten than the bad things or inappropriate behavior that seems to haunt me in the wee hours of the morning. There are things I would like to forget, but I can't. They're unreconciled. Maybe the time has passed when I could have rectified them, or they still hang out there like an unpaid invoice. They won't go away. They're genuinely unreconciled. The story goes of, of one of the most famous composers that we know, who had a rebellious son who used to come in late at night after his mother and father were gone to bed. And before going to his room, the rebellious son would go to his father's piano and he would slowly pay, play. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti. And then he wouldn't strike the last final do. Then leaving the scale unfinished, he'd go to his room. Meanwhile, his father, the great musician that he was, hearing the scale minus the final note would twist and turn and writhe on his bed, his mind unable to relax because the scale was not finished. Finally unable to stand, a, stand it any longer, the father would crawl out of bed, stumble down the stairs, and strike the final note of the scale. Only then could he relax and be at peace. That's what our unforgiven sin does to us. To gain peace, reconciliation has to take place. The scale has to be completed. When we come clean about our attitudes and our actions and receive a pardon and forgiveness from God, we are reconciled in our relationship with him. That's what happens when we respond to the invitation to forgiveness. And when we extend forgiveness to someone else, our relationship can become reconciled and has the possibility of being restored to what it was before the offense, though that may take some time and some real effort. We're reminded of how we often treat God when we think about this parable. We play around with some of the notes of the faith, but we don't play the complete scale. We forgive, but not completely. We love, but not completely. We serve, but not completely. We accept Christ, but not completely. We live the Christian lifestyle, but not completely. We commit our lives to God, but not completely. Even when we treat 
God poorly. In his amazing grace, he continues to reach out, play the last note, and love us. We seek relief and peace from those memories, and they won't go away. You see, relief only comes when we own our behavior and decide we need to make it right. I think that's precisely what Jesus is saying in his instruction. You know, he tells us how we should pray. Forgive us as we forgive. When it comes to forgiveness, we often seek what we are unwilling to offer others. And the damage is done to both. If we want forgiveness, we need to extend it. It's frightening to me that Jesus' words indicate a transactional approach to forgiveness. The text clearly says, forgive as, as we forgive others. We cannot be forgiven if we blame our behavior on someone else. Right, Mike? For one thing, we cannot be repentant for something we don't take responsibility for. If we mistreat someone or spread gossip about them, we should not look to be forgiven. Luke 6, 37 and 38 helps us understand the transactional nature of Jesus' teaching. Don't judge, and you won't be judged. Don't condemn, and you won't be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give, and you will be, it'll be given to you. A good portion, packed down, firmly shaken, and overflowing will fall into your lap. The portion you give will, be, will determine the portion you receive in return. Those two verses together, many people interpret verse 38 as being about money. Given will be given to you, full measure, pressed down, shaken together for the measure you give will be the measure you get back. And it can be. I've used it in stewardship campaigns. However, it says in this context that it's about our attitude. If we're stingy in our willingness or give conditions to forgive others, we are less likely to to receive forgiveness back. When we recognize our responsibility in our transactions, take ownership of it and extend grace to the other party, the door can open to receiving grace for ourselves. When we find ourselves in conflict, each of us must remember who we are as followers of Jesus. We're accepted despite our flaws. And we confess that Jesus died for us while we were yet sinners. Jesus doesn't say, Uh, you first. Or when you change your ways, although once we accept Christ as our Lord, we can't continue in the old life practices. Jesus is teaching that our behaviors get changed when grace is extended. It's important to remember that such an ability to forgive is not natural to us. Revenge is more natural. And while forgiving someone is on the pathway to heaven, it does not provide a ticket on the heavenly express. Jesus provides the ticket and the instructions on how to board the train. Part of the problem is that our forgiveness being dependent on how we forgive and treat others doesn't sound fair, right? Because we're still children of God, right? And you know how children behave. We do too sometimes. Well, she started it. She started it. We just want to get off the hook. It's not fair. It's not fair. Yeah. Only young children say that because those of the rest of us know that life isn't fair. Life isn't fair. We hear it shouldn't be that way. It would be reasonable for the other person to see how wrong they were and apologize to us. Wouldn't it be great if they took the first step? But that's not quite how Jesus frames it. 
Several years ago, Pastor Anthony Robinson wrote in the Christian Century, when our only measure is fairness, when our preoccupation is our just desserts, we lose touch with a sense of grace and graciousness. We forget about the people who love us more than we deserve. And the God who extends generosity and forgiveness to us. Repentance precedes forgiveness. That's to say being forgiven does not mean that we can go on mistreating others or that we have to accept the bad behavior of others. To be forgiven, we have to make a change. If we are in an abusive relationship, for instance, The abuse must stop. Abused spouses should not forgive the behavior of their abuser. Remorse is not repentance. Let me say that again. Because we can do stuff and we feel bad about it. And we apologize. But we don't really do anything to change how we behave. So we feel bad. And then we go on and keep doing it. Remorse only means that the abuser feels terrible but has not changed their behavior or their attitudes. The fake change only lasts until the next episode. So when Jesus directs the Samaritan woman at the well who was living an immoral life, just as the woman being stoned for adultery is saved from the punishment of her sin, he says, go and sin no more. And if they do not turn their backs on Jesus, even though they may not live a perfect life, they will continue to live in the grace of God. So on this day, not only do we remember the 2,977 casualties and the thousands of people impacted on that dreadful day, but we reflect on the causes of conflict, terrorism, and human division. It's all because we don't live the words of Jesus. Instead of respecting each other and finding ways to live together with differing views, nations are torn apart, lives are lost, economies are destroyed, and people suffer. So as Christians living as Jesus instructs, offering forgiveness provides not only peace in the world, it gives personal peace and guarantees our own forgiveness and hope for a better future. Let's pray together. Loving God, you are always ready to forgive our sins. We are much less eager to forgive those with whom we disagree. So often when we have something against our friends, family, or strangers, we escalate the conflict rather than working for unity. We resist your call to be ambassadors of reconciliation. We wish we could turn the other cheek, but it feels so much more satisfying to demonize the other side. Forgive us for these and all of our sins, and hear us now as we continue to confess sins in silence. We pray in the name of Jesus, the one who took our sin on himself, who gave his life that we might have redemption, who promises us that when we confess our sins and truly are repentant, our sins will be forgiven and will be removed of the burden. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Now we've come, prayed, and experienced God's presence through the preaching and the interpretation of the word. May that word with a capital W fill us and motivate you as you seek to live as Christ instructed his followers. And as you pray daily, may you offer the gift of forgiveness to others, especially those difficult circumstances. 
so that you too may receive grace from God, the Father, through Jesus, his Son. And when you have given and received that grace and forgiveness, know that the all-knowing and almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, will bless, preserve, and keep you by his grace and love and provide you strength to travel life's journey. Amen. Go in peace.